Welcome to our series on St. Matthew's Gospel. In this episode, we will be uh, dealing with the last two scenes in chapter 26. So we will be dealing with the trial of Jesus before the Sanhedrin and unfortunately the fall of Peter as well. And the two of them happen around the same time. So the whole drama of the Passion now moves from the slopes of the Mount of Olives and into the city of Jerusalem. And this is Jesus' last visit to Jerusalem. He will die outside of the city of Jerusalem within a very short time. Uh, we have watched the drama uh, between Jesus and the leadership of Israel uh, throughout our gospel uh, journey. But now we see the, the opposition between them coming to a climax. And the climax is when the high priest of the old covenant opposes the new and eternal high priest of the new covenant. And that is the illustration that you see in this picture, uh, the, the opposition between the two of them. And with the very small amount of light and enlightenment that the old high priest has, he opposes and condemns the new high priest. It's really sad. Uh, so in the text that I'm going to be sharing with you, Matthew wants you to do a little, a little homework. And the homework is that you would compare people. Uh, we're inclined to take um, the story of the passion of Jesus simply as a continuous set of actions without really thinking about them. But if you compare Jesus with the high priest, which is what we have illustrated here, uh, you will see that the old covenant and the new covenant are standing together in the person of these two. And you have the uh, new and eternal high priest standing there, pure, holy, not only representing the word of God, but the word of God incarnate and representing the wisdom of God and the wisdom of God incarnate. And he has determined to only do the will of God, not my will, but thine be done. That decision was made in Gethsemane. And so only God will be glorified through this man. Uh, and he will also uh, lay down his life for his friends and for uh, the human race. So he's showing the uh, zenith of what loving your neighbor is actually about. So Jesus will only serve God. Thy will be done for thy kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. So that's Jesus the prisoner standing before the old high priest, Caiaphas. And Caiaphas was not a nice person by any standards. Uh, he not only served God, but he served money. Uh, and not only that, but he served wealth and power and politics. And he was uh, prepared to even commit crimes in order to get his way. So here you have uh, the new and eternal high priest confronting the old failed priesthood of the Aaronic line. And not only that, but during this trial with Jesus standing before Caiaphas, Caiaphas is going to make a, a one simple action, which is extremely important. And that is at a certain point, he takes hold of his robes and he actually tears them. Now that's forbidden according to the law because the high priest's robes were sacred, they were not his own. What Caiaphas doesn't realize is that in that action, he has signified the end of the Aaronic priesthood. So here we have the beginning of the Passion and the first sign of the end of the Mosaic era, the end of the Aaronic priesthood. And when Jesus dies, the veil in the temple will tear in half without anybody touching it, signifying the end of the sacrifices and the end of the Mosaic era. Of course, the priests are not going to pay any attention to that, and they will uh, continue uh, for a number of years after Jesus' death, as if nothing had happened. But it's a bit like ivy on a wall when you have cut the roots and there is no future for that particular plant. Um, so this is the very first sad uh, comparison that he wants you to make. The second one 
is just as sad. And that is that in this trial, I will show you as we go along, there are three apostles present, Peter, John, and Judas. Now, Matthew doesn't mention John at all. You have to go to John's gospel for that. But he does give you Peter. And by implication, he gives you Judas, which I will uh, explain later. So if you do a comparison between Jesus and Peter, you have the eternal high priest now and the one who's going to step into his shoes in a very short time. It's very sad because before the uh, leadership of Israel, Jesus will affirm his identity. He will acknowledge that he is the Messiah and that he is the Son of God and that he is the triumphant Son of Man as well. He will affirm all of that at the cost of his life. Peter will deny it all. And not only that, but he will deny that he's a disciple. He will deny that he ever knew the man. And he'll deny it with cursing and swearing, breaking the law. Jesus said, do not take oaths, do not curse. And so in this trial, uh, you see that nobody actually stands for the will of God and the glory of God except Jesus himself. It's amazing. Now, there's another comparison you have to do as well. Of the three disciples that are present, Peter and Judas are the ones that Matthew gives attention to. John is too good for Matthew, you know. So he deals with Peter and Judas. And the reason why he does is that he wants to give a solemn warning to the leadership of the church for all time not to go down this route. And so if you compare Peter with Judas, there's only one thing that makes a difference between the two of them. Both of them deny Jesus and both of them do it in public. Both of them betray him. Both of them do it in public. What is the difference? And the difference is that in spite of all his weaknesses and his sinfulness, Peter actually loves Jesus. He actually does. And so when he realizes uh, what he has done, he, he repents and he recovers. I'll tell you more about Peter later. Judas has no love for Jesus. That's his problem. And if somebody has no love for Jesus in them, their faith just simply dies because faith has to be burning with love. Do you remember the parable of the bridesmaids? And because uh, Judas only served himself and his own agenda, then we find that when he denies Jesus, uh, he himself is brought down to the nothing that is within him. It's really sad. So let's come to the interrogation of Jesus by the leadership of Israel. This is a, an extremely important section, uh, and it's chapter 26 from verse 59 uh, to 68, the whole event. You're told by Matthew that it's the whole Sanhedrin. I hope it wasn't, because the whole Sanhedrin was 72 members altogether. Now, some of them would be old and mightn't be able to attend. Some of them would be sick and they mightn't be able to attend. But the whole membership was actually 72. And when Jesus stands in front of these, there's something you need to remember, something that actually Matthew didn't tell you. And that is that this is not the first time for Jesus to stand among the doctors of the law. He stood in front of them when he was 12 years of age and absolutely wowed them. But you've got to go to St. Luke for that. And so here is Jesus. When he was young, they thought he was absolutely fantastic. Now that he is in his uh, mature years, uh, they condemn him completely. They will not accept at all what he is saying. We've already been through all the, the chapters from chapter 15 where uh, Jesus was judging the people and the leadership and the, the nation and absolutely everything else. We know that Jesus is the eschatological judge as well, the one who will judge us all at the end of time. And so what you have here is that Jesus, first of all, gave his indictment against the leadership in chapter 15 and chapter 23. He gave his indictment against the, the uh, lake towns of Galilee in chapter 12. Um, and so he has actually given his judgment to Israel. And the final one 
was the cursing of the fig tree. This nation is going to die. So he who has already judged Israel is now judged by the leaders of Israel. And while he cursed the fig tree, knowing that that meant that the nation was going to die, the nation in the leadership that is, represents them actually condemns him to die. So you've got this mutual death sentence. Somebody's word is true. And whoever, who, whoever has the word that is true is the true leader. And what we have found so far is that anything Jesus said was true, it was fact, it was reality. So let's look at this meeting of theirs. First of all, a uh, meeting at night was an illegal meeting, but this particular gathering is illegal from every angle. First of all, they sent out spies in the middle of the night uh, to ar arrest Jesus uh, surreptitiously uh, so that there would be nobody around to actually witness it. So the arrest is wrong. And so they bring him into a meeting which is illegal. The time was wrong. Uh, they were not allowed to meet at night. Uh, they brought false witnesses against Jesus, which is illegal. Uh, they only want to, to kill him by any excuse which means that this, as a law court, has no value whatsoever. They then insist by putting Jesus under oath that he will contemn himself out of his own mouth. That was condemned by the law as well. Now, when I'm talking about the law, I'm talking about the Torah. I'm talking about the very law that constituted these men, the leadership, that constituted them the doctors and teachers of the law that constituted them the leaders of the nation. They are breaking the law all the time in dealing with Jesus. It's incredible. And one of the things that's absolutely not allowed in any court, whether it's Jewish, Christian, Hindu, or anything else, is that there's no defense for the accused. Somebody must be there to give the other side of the picture. There always is more than one side to a picture. No defense was allowed for Jesus, none whatsoever. And the final thing that was completely illegal about this meeting is that his guilt was presumed. They did it because they wanted to kill him. Now, when we go through the Passion, you will find the only people who said Jesus was guilty was these men. Even Judas, before he dies, will say he was innocent. Pilate will say he was innocent. The Roman soldiers will say he was a saint. He was a holy man. So if all of these aspects of this gathering are illegal, then it means that the conclusion or the verdict that they come to is invalid by any court of law. Even the most pagan court of law would consider it in invalid. They want to kill Jesus. And what we're going to find here is that Caiaphas will accuse Jesus of blasphemy. Well, the death for blasphemy, or the punishment for blasphemy, was death by stoning. And you see this in Acts chapter 7, when they actually stoned Stephen for blasphemy. Now, the Roman uh, authorities allowed them to do that, but they don't want Jesus to die quickly. Uh, if stoning is done properly, the head is crushed by large stones. And so the death is over in about 15 minutes. That's not what they want for Jesus. These men want Jesus to die so slowly that he will be brought down as a person, that all his resistance will be brought down. They want him to sin against God. They want him to blaspheme. They want him to do the thing they've accused him of, because up to now, they can accuse him of nothing. He was able to say to them, but you'll find these words in John's gospel and not in, in Matthew's gospel, can anyone convict me of sin? But they very badly want him to sin. 
and they know that if you torture a person to the point where they can no longer tolerate anything, that all their resistance will break down. And they were used to people under torture, cursing and swearing simply because they couldn't cope with the pain. They want Jesus to do that. And if Jesus does that, then they have destroyed his name. They've destroyed his reputation. He couldn't possibly be the Messiah. He's definitely not a holy man. He's a cursed. Cursed be any man who hangs on a tree. And that's what they want. The only authority that can do that are the Roman authorities. They have not permitted the Jewish authorities to do this. But there's a sting in this. The Roman authorities would never crucify a Roman citizen because they considered it a death that was far too humiliating for anyone who had dignity, for anyone who had any worth at all. It was too humiliating. But they would gladly do it for the Jews because they hated them. Now, what Matthew is trying to tell us is that the Jewish high priesthood had to have a hatred for Jesus that was so extreme that they would go to these authorities knowing that these authorities would only give this type of death to a Jewish person. And they would not only ask it for Jesus, but they would ask it for their Messiah. And they would ask it for the King of the Jews. It doesn't make any sense. It's completely irrational. And I'm just giving it to you from their point of view. It's completely irrational. So you can see that uh, Satan has really taken over and that in the um, whole event that's going to happen that we call the Passion of Jesus, uh, the Jews are going to be completely humiliated by the Romans. Their king is going to be completely mocked by the Romans. Everything they stand for is going to be completely uh, mocked by the Romans. And in the end, the Romans will destroy the temple and the city and their nation. These men are insane. By going to the, uh, the Roman authorities looking for this, it's complete insanity. They think that by killing Jesus, that they themselves can stay in power. Not at all. Jesus' word will come true. Theirs won't. And one of the things that they do is they bring false witnesses against Jesus. And they, lots of things are said which are contradicting each other, so that couldn't hold. And then two witnesses came forward, and one of them said, this man said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will build it up. That's very interesting because Matthew never told you about that. You find that in John's Gospel. And it's in chapter 2, verse 19 of John's Gospel, not in Matthew. And here you have the evidence that while the gospel writers will give you a certain amount of information, that there's lots more in the background that they're not actually giving to you. St. John said, if everything we knew about Jesus was written down, the whole world would be full of books. So I find just this very interesting. If you simply stay with Matthew's evidence, we find that in chapter 24, Jesus did prophesy the destruction of the temple and the destruction of the city. And he did say, your house will be left desolate to you, but he did not say anybody would rebuild it. He did not say that. Um, and so if you're only taking Matthew's uh, account into consideration, then you've got to realize that that statement is twisting Jesus's words, because if you're only looking at Matthew 24 and what Jesus said there, Jesus said nothing about rebuilding the temple at all. So who's going to, whose word is going to be true? What these people say or what Jesus said? By the time Matthew wrote the gospel, the, the temple was gone, the city was gone. And Matthew actually didn't le live long enough uh, to see the nation die as well. He, he, he was dead before then. So the, the word of Jesus is going to happen, uh, not the word of these false witnesses. Okay. But Matthew wants you to connect the death of Jesus with the death of the temple. 
And that is signified in the tearing of the veil, the sacred veil that nobody could touch. The death of Jesus signifies the, the death of the temple, the death of the city, and the death of the people. So Caiaphas is very blind. He has no wisdom, no understanding. He does not appear to know what God is saying to either him or the nation. And so he does something that he should never have done, which was to put a person on trial for his life under oath. Now we know that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, do not take oaths. But Jesus is standing before the, the one person in the Old Covenant that has authority from God, and he respects it. God will always respect true authority. And this man said to Jesus, I put you on oath by the living God. Now the living God is Jesus' father. Avi, my father. And if you put Jesus on oath by the living God to say something, he will say it. And what Jesus actually said to uh, Caiaphas when he was asked, are you truly the son of God? In other words, are you divine? Because they were all sons of God according to the covenant. Everybody knew that. But the Son of God means that you're claiming to be divine as well as human. And he also said, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Well, this was not the situation in which to ask somebody, are you the Christ? Or are you the Son of God? You've got the man on trial for his life. This is crazy. That should have been asked in all the years that, uh, that led up to this. That should have been settled in all the debates with Jesus in the time of the ministry. Not now. And the very fact that Caiaphas has asked the question means that Caiaphas thinks it's ludicrous. Jesus gives an answer to Caiaphas that he gave to Judas, Caiaphas and Pilate, the three great unbelievers that he had to face in the Passion. And he said exactly the same thing to the three of them. You have said it. The words are yours. And in each case, each of these three persons stated a truth, but as a question. And Jesus being wisdom incarnate will not get caught out in his words. So he simply said, the words are yours. You've stated the truth. So, Jesus then uh, said something to Caiaphas that is so important, but if we don't put it in the context of the whole gospel, we ha are not really hearing what he's saying. Jesus said, moreover, in other words, not only that, not only have you stated the truth, but I'm going to add something to it. From this time onward, now this time is the time of Jesus' hour, the time of his passion and death and resurrection. From this time onwards, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power. Now, because he's speaking to the high priest, he will never say God. And he will certainly not pronounce God's name. He said, seated at the right hand of the power, which is the way that these uh, Sanhedrin would have spoken about God. And you will see him coming on the clouds of heaven. You only have to go to Acts chapter seven with Stephen, the first martyr, standing in front of the same Sanhedrin accused of the same things. And Stephen has a vision of Jesus standing at the right hand of God in power and glory. And he tells the Sanhedrin there's only a couple of months in between the two events. And one is the prophecy and the other is the fulfillment. I'll come back to that. There's more to be said. Thank you for listening. Slán agus bánach day live. Goodbye. God bless you.
The work of Shalom is an essential part and a powerful part of the work of evangelization, of promoting the objective of sharing the good news of the gospel, the joy of the good news of the gospel and its promise of salvation in this life and beyond death in the new life of the risen Lord. Its evangelization of culture and civilization is a most important objective for the people of God and the church right around the world. In this 21st century, when the human family is battered by so many forces of change, of uncertainty, forces which seem to threaten and menace hope, the hope of the risen Christ and of the good news of the gospel is something which has to be shared not only between individuals, but with communities of peoples right around the nations of God's earth. May the Lord bestow his blessing on the work of Shalom, on all who are, so who are associated with it, and also indeed on all those who through their charity and kindness support its most important work. <laughs> <laughs>